Majority Floor Leader. Madam Speaker, I move that we defer the calling of the roll. Are there any objections? Hearing none, please proceed. Madam Speaker, considering that copies of the journal of the previous session have been distributed to the members, I move that we dispense with the reading of the journal. Any objections? Hearing none, the chair, the chair hears none. Journal. Madam Speaker, yes. I move that we approve journals number 22, dated September 14, 2016. Any objections? Chair hears none. Journal numbers 22 and 23 are approved. Madam Speaker, I move that we now proceed with the reference of business and request that the Secretary General be directed to read titles of bills and resolutions on first reading, as well as communications. The Secretary General, please, please proceed. Reference of business bills on first reading, House Bill 3559, formally incorporating the Malampaya Sound Protected Landscape and Seascape in Palawan Province, Representative Alvarez France. To the Committee on Natural Resources. House Bill 3560, mandating the Philippine Crop Insurance Corporation to offer index-based insurance coverage, Representative Yap Arthur. To the Committee on Government Enterprises and Privatization. House Bill 3561, declaring September 17 every year special non-working holiday in Los Baños, Laguna, Representative Chipeco. To the Committee on Revision of Laws. House Bill 3562, mandating the construction of public restrooms along national roads, Representative Mercado. To the Committee on Public Works and Highways. House Bill 3563, enhancing the Philippine basic education system, Representative Salo. To the Committee on Basic Education and Culture. House Bill 3564, supporting scaling up nutrition during the first 1,000 days of life, Representative Baguila. To the Committee on Health. House Bill 3565, providing for a more responsive and comprehensive regulation for the practice, licensing, registration, right, and certification of sanitary and environmental engineers, Representative Baguila. To the Committee on Civil Service and Professional Regulation. House Bill 3566, creating four additional RTC branches in Sambuanga City, Representative Dalipe. To the Committee on Justice. House Bill Numbers 3567 and 3568, converting certain roads in Cebu into national roads, Representative Gullias. To the Committee on Public Works and Highways. House Bill 3569, reclassifying certain parcels of land of the public domain in various barangays of Aborland, Palawan Province as alienable and disposable land, Representative Acosta. To the Committee on Natural Resources. House Bill 3570, making teachers work for only half a day, Representative Bilaro. To the Committee on Basic Education and Culture. Communications, letters dated May 31, June 17, 20, and 27, and July 18, of Roland A. Ray. To the Committee on Appropriations. Letter dated July 20, 25, July 2016, of Salvador C. Mijaldea, Executive Secretary. To the Archives. Letter dated August 16, of Evelyn P. Reyes, COA. To the Committee on Appropriations. Letter dated August 26, of Jelu G. G. Jela, State Auditor, COA. To the Committee on Appropriations. Majority Leader. Madam Speaker, I move that we acknowledge the guests in the gallery. They are guests of Representative Geraldine Roman of the 1st District of Bataan and Representative Kaka Bagao of the Lone District of Dinagat Island. To the guests of uh, Congresswoman Bagao and Roman, please rise as you are called. We have in Welcome. the gallery Ambassador Luis Calvo of Spain, Ambassador-designate John Holmes of Canada. Welcome to the House of Representatives. Ambassador Kok Lee Peng, Embassy of Singapore to the Philippines. Martin Makalintal, Attaché, Embassy of France to the Philippines. Representative from M the Embassy of the United States to the Philippines, Human Rights Officer of the, U of the U.S. Embassy, and from the Embassy of Australia, the Economic Se Se Section, Senior Program Officer, Development Section, and Consultant of the Embassy of Australia. From Comelec, we have Commissioner Rowena Guanzon, 
the, we have the Vice President of Philippine College of Criminology, Emilita Apostol Alvarez, the President of the Congressional Spouses Foundation Incorporated, former Congressman Willa Villarama and family, Willy Villarama and family, Friedrich Peralta, Paul Cabral, Rajo Laurel, board member Dexter Dominguez, Sangonian Bayan members from the municipality of Dinalupihan, province of Bataan, Mayor Efren Pascual Jr. from the municipality of Orani, Vice Mayor Godofredo Galicia from the municipality of Orani, and the Sangonian Bayan members of the municipality of Orani. Welcome to the House of Representatives. We also have Cynthia, Mayor Cynthia Estanislao and former Mayor George Estanislao of the municipality of Morong. Mayor Generoso de la Fuente of the municipality of Samal. Mayor Antonio Joseph Inton of the municipality of Hermosa. We have the LGU officials from the Gupan City, Pangasinan. Gender Equality and Human Rights from the Commission on Human Rights. Uh, we have uh, Lisa Dino, the Chairman of the Film Development Council. From Caritas, Manila, we have Father Anton Pascual. Welcome to the House of Representatives. And uh, Madam Speaker, we have uh, members of various organizations present here. The uh, Gay Alliance for Len Alonte, or GALA. Welcome to the House of Representatives. Rotary Club of Makati. Akbayan LGBT Collective. Babaylanes Incorporated. Akbayan Youth from UP Diliman. UP Babaylan. Buklod CSSP from UP, UP Diliman. Association of Transgender People in the Philippines, or ATP. TLF Share. Youth Reform Movement Philippines. Gender and Development Advocates, or Ganda Pilipinas. Amnesty International Philippines Youth. Circle of Public Administration and Governance from PUP Manila. Metro Manila Pride. ASEAN Soji Caucus. Philippine LGBT Chamber of Commerce. Team Magazine. LGBT Politician. Rainbow Rights. Ang Lad Lad. LGBT Filipinas. ASOG. LGBT Bar. Welcome to the House of Representatives. LGBTF Christian Church, Galang Pilipinas, Galang Philippines, Bahaghari. We also have Gabriela Youth, Gabriela Women's Party, Kabataan Party List, Kalika UP, Ganda Pilipinas, Trans. Brotherhood of the Philippines, Lesbian, Gay, Bisexual, Transgender, Queer, LGBTQ, Alianza ng mga mag-aaral para sa panlipunang katwiran at kaunlaran, UPD, and guests from the 1st District of Bataan. We also acknowledge Raymond Ang, 
BJ Pascual, Martin Bautista, and Bong Prada Lin. We would like to acknowledge further guests, uh, guests of Honorable Eric Olivares from the 1st District of Paranaque. We have Ms. Eva Olivares, Vice President, Finance and Administration of Olivares College. Ms. Rose Vidyadalion. Dr. Ellen San Nicolas Salak. Dr. Esther B. Vedania. Dr. Vinci Nicolas Villaseñor. Ms. Maria Regina Milagros C. Manabat. Dr. Paulo Campos. Dr. Adley C. Castigador. Dr. Nanita B. Nagarit. Ms. Gloria Ascano. Ms. Emilia Javier. Ms. Cecilia Pring. Ms. Geraldine De Erit. Ms. Janet Kalupitan. Ms. Leonor Tin and Ms. Jade Salvador. To all the guests present tonight, to the multinational and multi-gender guests of uh, our colleagues here, welcome to the whole House of Representatives. Majority Floor Leader. Madam Speaker, we would like to acknowledge um, Ms. from Ms. Janel May Freyna, the first female Grand Master of the Philippines and her party. Welcome to the House of Representatives. Please rise. Um, we have, of course, Ms. Janet May Freyna, Mr. Eugenio Torre, Mr. George Freyna, Mrs. Sonia Freyna, Mr. Don Marifil Freyna, Mr. Jason Gonzalez, and Mr. Leo. The Philippine chess team, men and women. Uh, this is sponsored by our representatives, Representative Joey Sarte Salceda, Representative Edsel C. Lagman, Representative Fernando V. Gonzalez, Representative Rodel M. Batucabe, Representative Alfredo A. Garbin Jr., Representative Christopher S. Ko, and Representative Prospero A. Pichai Jr. To the Philippine Chess Team, welcome to the House of Representatives. Further, further guests of Representative Madrona from the Rhone District of Romblon, Vice Mayor Lloyd George Fegalan, Sangunian Bayan members. Please, please rise as your names are called. Sangunian Bayan members: Felix Berto Fadrilan, Tessie Fajut, Alan Fabula, Jefferson Famadico, Patricio Flores, Imelda Fietas, Carmelita Federanga, and the Secretary Michael Fadrilin. Fa Fadralan, sorry. Fadrilan. Welcome to the House of Representatives. Madam Speaker, today being a Monday and pursuant to our rules, I move that we open the privilege hour. Is there any objections? There being none, the chair declares the privilege hour. Majority floor leader. Madam Speaker, I now move that the gentleman from the third district of Bohol the Honorable Arthur Yap be recognized to avail of the privilege hour. The gentleman from Bohol is now recognized. Madam Speaker, Honorable colleagues, distinguished guests, friends, I rise on a matter of personal and collective privilege not to discuss the current burning issues of the day, 
but what others have called the burning issue of past decades. Madam Speaker, I speak of financing Philippine agriculture. The Duterte administration vowed to make the Philippines safer by ridding our streets of the menace of drugs. Confidently, the administration declared change is coming. And from all indications, the government is steadily and dramatically, if not controversially, delivering on its promise. As many applaud these developments, other sectors of society eagerly await change to come to their lives. One of these long-suffering sectors is the rural sector. Poverty in the Philippines, according to the Asian is a rural phenomenon with about 40% of the rural population categorized as poor compared to an average national poverty incidence of about 25%. The farm sector is characterized by low productivity and poor infrastructure. Many eagerly await the promise of free and expanded irrigation services plus infrastructure support for roads, logistics, post-harvest facilities, storage and warehousing, among others. These are not new requests. Many of us here continually lobby for the release of these assistance to our constituents. Unfortunately, Madam Speaker, due to the costs involved in the scale of construction that needs to be done, these requests will need time to execute. In the meantime, climate change continues to beat down on our farmers. Of 186 countries surveyed by the Climate Change Vulnerability Index, the Philippines came in 13th as most vulnerable even as this important improvement from past surveys. Many of us here need no study to tell us what we have to suffer through year after year. From 2010 to 2015, the Department of Agriculture Operations Group PEG consolidated crop losses at a staggering 190 billion. When these damages were inflicted on our farmers, our farmers did not have the security of savings nor insurance to mitigate the impact of losses and damages upon them. In fact, Madam Speaker, effectively, insurance is absence due to the fact that our insurance products are defectively designed in the Philippines. Agriculture crop insurance continues to be peril or indemnity based today. This means that farmers pay premiums. It is no wonder, Madam Speaker, that crop insurance is not popular in our country. Data gathered from the Philippine Crop Insurance Corporation bear this out. During the period 2010 to 2015, when consolidated losses summed up to 190 billion, payouts merely reached 3.6 billion, or not even 2% of crop damages. Beyond laying the blame on PCIC's performance, we have to recognize that the insignificant payout rate may very well be due to the absence of the correct insurance product today. However, in other parts of the world, particularly India, the Caribbean, and in Africa, which, which are all also reeling from the effects of climate change, crop insurance is being offered on the basis of innovative terms. Instead of being peril-based or indemnity-based, crop insurance in those areas are weather index-based, or WIB, W-I-B-I. Madam Speaker, Many in this chamber are farmers, but we do not need to be farmers to know how the climate significantly and substantively affects yields of crops. All along the planting season and the cropping cycle, dips and highs in temperature and weather patterns affect crop yields. Disasters do not need to occur to subject farmers to crop damages. For this reason, how does weather index-based insurance work? Very simply, WIBI or WIB takes related measures like rainfall, precipitation, wind speed, temperature, 
dry spells, and even historical crop yield data and converts them into an index. Since we all know that there is a correlation between weather and crop yields, what triggers the payment is not the occurrence of a disaster, but the breaching of the index. When the weather index is breached, we all know that the farmer's harvest will be affected. And under Weeby, he will be paid long before the occurrence of an actual calamity. Take rice, for example. As can be seen from this chart, water affects rice yield significantly in different stages. In the first stage, in the vegetative stage, water requirement for rice is about 238 millimeters for 55 days. In the second stage, 151 millimeters for 35 days. And on the last stage, 129 millimeters of, right, of water for 30 days. Science and empirical data through the fill rice have set this relationship. Along the way, fill rice has also established that once these indices are breached, if during the vegetative stage, the rice crop does not receive 238 millimeters of water for 55 days, there is bound to be water stress. And as much as 30% of the rice crop will be affected even before the ripening stage. Next slide. Temperature as well plays a very critical role. For example, for rice again. Rice cannot suffer a maximum temperature of not more than 35 degrees centigrade for 10 days during the day. And it cannot suffer a minimum temperature cannot suffer more than the minimum temperature of 25 degrees centigrade for 15 days at night time. If you breach these parameters, you will affect the rice harvest. This is the reason why we can see that without having to wait for a calamity to transpire, we can peg our insurance payments on the basis of these index parameters. The rice farmer can be paid sooner rather than later to allow him to save his investment. Many will find this idea abstract or light years away from implementation. Some here may think that we are still dreaming. However, in an experimental area, hundreds of farmers in Mindanao are actually presently enrolled in a WIB program, WIBA program, pioneered by PCIC itself with technical and funding support from the United Nations Development Program, the UNDP. Based on the model built by these pioneering institu institutions, hundreds of farmers have been paid during the planting cycle when the climate or the weather index is breached without need of waiting for a calamity to visit disaster or devastation on our farmers. WIBI is the only way to go in the future. Administration of the insurance products are simpler because there is no need to maintain so many people to process information or adjust damages on the field. Indices are maintained by a credible third party like Pag-asa. So the moral hazard of compromised payments due to fraudulent data is virtually eradicated overnight, making assessors or adjusters redundant. WIBI insurance, coupled later on by an institutionalized agricultural guarantee fund pool, which we can discuss in another session, plus free irrigation as promised by this administration, can form the backbone of government support for our farmers to turn them into cost-effective food producers. Eradicating rural poverty and alleviating farm misery from the quandary of generational debt is an end we must pledge our efforts to because, Madam Speaker, profitability in agriculture, especially in these times when we are subjected to the violence of climate change, is the only sure way to achieve food security for our people. Profitability assures food security. It is for this end that I seek your support, Mr. Speaker, Madam Speaker, and I seek this august chamber's innovative thinking and support to join me as I call for the recapitalization and the expansion of the Philippine Crop Insurance Corporation's mandate 
to engage in reinsurance and direct insurance of weather index-based insurance products for crops and agriculture. Allowing PCIC to specifically engage in these products will embolden the private sector to partner with the government in coming up with innovative insurance products which we can roll out to our farmers. Madam Speaker, colleagues, the tides wait for no man, nor will nature yield its powers to us. We may not have polluted this planet, and yet we are most vulnerable to climate change effects. Without risk mitigating instruments like these to ensure capital flow and risk transfers in agriculture, our farmers stand no chance to escape the poverty trap brought upon by the stream of never-ending deaths resulting from weather-related crop losses. The time to act was yesterday, but some say the time to act was even decades ago. Yet even so, we can still act now to save our farmers rather than sit by in hopelessness and in action. Madam Speaker, thank you very much. Majority Floor Leader. Madam Speaker, I move that we refer the speech of the Honorable Arthur Yap to the Committee on Rules for its appropriate action. Is there any objection? Hearing none, the motion is carried. Madam Speaker, next to be recognized is the Chairman of the Appropriations Committee from the 1st District of Davao City, the Honorable Carlo Nograles. Madam Honorable uh, Nograles is recognized. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Madam Speaker, dear colleagues, on Friday, September 16, 2016, the Chair of the Senate Committee on Justice presented a surprise witness in the Senate hearing on extrajudicial killings. This witness was indeed a surprise. Even the chairperson of the committee that was jointly conducting the hearings on extrajudicial killings was not informed of his appearance before the committee to what and for what purpose he was to testify. This surprise witness was also full of incredible surprises. First off, he claimed he was a hired killer with an incredible kill record of around 1,000 murders perpetrated singly and or in cooperation with other hired killers in the most savage and heinous ways imaginable. Even the most murderous cinematic villain could not measure up to his record of kills. Among the surprises that came out of his mouth was his claim that upon the orders of then Mayor Rodrigo Duterte, four bodyguards of my father, then Speaker Prospero Nograles, were kidnapped and killed during the election period of 2010. My father and I have come out to dispute this lie and set the record straight. No one among the security personnel assigned to him during the period or at any other period during his incumbency as representative of the 1st District of Davao or as Speaker of the House of Representatives was kidnapped or killed. The stories of this surprise witness became even increasingly fantastic as he kept on piling one lie after another in the course of the Senate hearing. What takes the cake, Madam Speaker, is his tall tale of an unarmed man who amazingly survived even after being shot and hit by no less than 30 gunmen firing at him simultaneously. Madam Speaker, Daig Bayata si Rambo, Chuck Norris, and Terminator combined. His testimony has since been proven to be a litany of lies. One by one, people with facts and evidence at their fingertips came out to unravel one lie after the other. 
Madam Speaker, we all know of the legal maxim, falsus in uno, falsus in omnibus. This surprise witness has turned out to be nothing but a false witness. And it is lamentable, Madam Speaker, that this false witness was presented before a Senate hearing by the chair of a Senate committee without informing the committee members about the existence of this person. Was there even a vetting procedure to validate the claims of this witness? More lamentable was how the chair of the Senate committee was aiding the false witness, clarifying and explaining testimonial details and facts as if she was the witness herself. She appeared to have swallowed the testimony of this false witness, hook, line, and sinker, and she was doing her very best to make the public swallow the same litany of canards as Bible truth as well. The hearing became a blatant mockery of the integrity of legislative inquiries in aid of legislation. I respect tradition, Madam Speaker. I am fully aware of the unwritten rule of interchamber courtesy. And I've restrained myself from questioning the adherence to chamber rules on inquiries in the conduct of the Senate investigation at issue. But I cannot help myself from being amazed. How could the glaring inconsistencies and distortions of facts and events be overlooked that this surprise witness would merit being heard in a legislative hearing upon the direct endorsement of the committee chair herself. What we witnessed in that sad episode of a Senate hearing was not a sincere search for truth on the matter of extrajudicial killings. What we witnessed was a calculated and unmitigated direct assault on the dignity and reputation of the President of the Republic for reasons I can only surmise as dangerous to the stability of this Republic. The weapon used was a false witness. The platform from which the assault was mounted is a Senate investigation supposedly in aid of legislation. The assault on the dignity and reputation of the sitting President of the Republic has only one ultimate objective, to destroy public trust and confidence in the President. So I ask, Madam Speaker, what is behind this assault on the dignity and reputation of the President? Is the groundwork being laid for something sinister? A sense of deja vu de descends upon us, Madam Speaker. Foreign media has entered the fray, and this information is being peddled on the current state of affairs in the country. International talking heads are pontificating on violations of human rights, and their statements are barely concealed declarations that the President has authorized state-sponsored killings in his administration's war against drug trafficking and use. A coordinated attack on the presidency appears to have been launched from within and from without. Lies are being piled one after another to waylay the president's change agenda and stop the momentum for radical reform towards making government work as it should work for the people. At stake, is not simply the success of the war against illegal drugs or the agenda for reform of the Duterte administration. At stake, in real terms, is not even the presidency. It is the stability and survival of our republic. We cannot sit idly and be content watching at the sidelines, Madam Speaker. So I rise not only as a Dabawenyo defending a fellow Dabawenyo, the President. I rise to sound the call for all Filipinos 
to stand in defense of our aspirations for stability and survival and meaningful change in how government works to serve the people. In this spirit, I condemn in the strongest terms the lies being peddled to destroy the dignity and reputation of the President and the use of congressional inquiries in aid of legislation as platforms for peddling these lies to achieve purposes that undermine the stability and survival of the nation. In the same spirit, I call for vigilance from the members of this chamber, vigilance in defense of what is true and just and right in government, and vigilance in honoring the mandate of our people when they voted overwhelmingly for meaningful change in government under the leadership of President Duterte. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Thank you, dear colleagues. Good afternoon. Thank you, Honorable Nograles. Majority Floor Leader. Madam Speaker, the Honorable Nograles has indicated that he does, he does not wish to be interpolated. With that, I move to refer the speech of the Honorable Nograles to the Committee on Rules for its appropriate action. Is there any objection? The Chair hears none. The motion is approved. Madam Speaker, next to be recognized is the lady from the 1st District of Bataan, the Representative Honorable Geraldine B. Roman. Representative Geraldine Roman of the 1st District of Bataan is recognized. Madam Speaker, I rise on a question of personal and collective privilege. I say personal from the innermost recesses of my heart and my memory. Because part of what I am about to share with the members of this august body and with our visitors in the galleries was written by my late father, Tony P. Roman Jr., a former member of this house and a friend to many of you. Tony Roman was the epitome of a macho politician with his iconic mustache and charming good looks. He is remembered as a legislator with a gift of eloquence and communication, as well as a much appreciated sense of humor expressed with his baritone voice. Former Congressman and now UN Ambassador Teddy Boy Loxin once described Tony Roman as a sharp lawmaker who drafted laws like an experienced surgeon cuts with a knife. But you know what? I remember him most, not because of all of these wonderful traits, which make me very proud as a daughter. I remember him dearly because he was a father who loved, accepted, supported, and defended me, Geraldine Roman, his transgender daughter, with no question or condition whatsoever. In October 2013, shortly before the barangay elections of that year, as my mother and I were busy meeting with the barangay captains, I clearly recall how my father, then a frail shadow of the sturdy man that he used to be, because he had already lost 30 pounds of weight due to emphysema, how he called me out of that meeting and sat me down in a corner of our living room. He held my arm and said, Jerry, I know you're going to make it as a congresswoman. How I pray I will still be around when you make it. But just in case, I want you to know that I dreamt of you last night delivering your first privileged speech. I want you to remember what I am about to tell you. Really, Daddy? I asked him. Did you really dream of me delivering my first privileged speech? 
you know, my dear colleagues, to be honest, at that moment I had a gut feeling that all he wanted me to do was just to memorize his own thoughts. And that he was just using his so-called dream as an excuse to convince me to use his words when this time comes. Yes, I dreamt it, he assured me. Just remember these words. My dear colleagues, Madam Speaker, what I heard surprised me. Rather than a victorious speech with a legislative agenda meant to impress my future colleagues, what he was telling me basically constituted a plea. Instead of a triumphant discourse meant to shame potential detractors, my father's speech sounded more like an appeal for my colleagues to look beyond my gender and to accept me as an equal. It was an appeal meant for you, my dear colleagues in Congress, to overcome whatever biases and prejudices you may have and focus on what I have to offer. It was a humble plea for all of you to respect me if not for who I am, for who I represent. And these are the noble people of the first district of Bataan. The better part of me could not imagine saying these words, these words of supplication. But I could understand where those words were coming from. Here was a father who was dying. He was not questioning my qualifications nor my ability to win. But he knew perfectly well that for me to be an effective lawmaker, I had to gain the respect of my colleagues. And my father, he was willing to beg for that respect, all for the sake of his transgender daughter. If my father could hear me now, I would tell him this. Daddy, you and I need not beg my colleagues for respect. I am glad and proud that the members of the 17th Congress have not only welcomed me with open arms, they have dealt with me as a full-fledged member and colleague as an equal. Daddy, you would be glad to know that they have treated me with the dignity and respect that is due all human beings. For this, mga minamahal ko mang kasamaan sa Kongreso, maraming maraming salamat po. Nais din ang LGBT community. Pasalamatan ang aking mga kasamaan sa Kongreso na lumagda bilang co-authors ng anti-discrimination bill on the basis of sexual orientation and gender identity. Nakikita niyo yung mga rosas sa mesa ninyo? Tanggapin po ninyo ang mga rosas na yan bilang simbolo ng pagkakaisa at pasasalamat. Kayo po, mga binamahal kong kasamahan, ang hashtag Equality Champions of the 17th Congress. Palakpakan po natin ang ating mga Equality Champions. Madam Speaker, my dear colleagues, I stand before you in a question of personal privilege, but I also speak to you on a matter of collective significance. I say collective because what I thought would be a victory for an ordinary politician like myself has instead been described as a turning point, a paradigm shift a light at the end of the tunnel for a sector of society that has long been judged, marginalized, and neglected. As much as I would have wanted to focus my entire energy to serving the people of the First District of Bataan in the tradition of my father and my mother, I cannot turn my back at a group of people 
who have long suffered discrimination and have long been denied adequate legal protection. How can I turn my back? How can I turn a blind eye to the suffering that I myself have experienced at some point in my life? My dear colleagues, you know who I am talking about. We are your brothers. We are your sisters your sons and daughters, your nieces and nephews. We are your family. We are your friends, your schoolmates, your colleagues at work, your Twitter and Facebook buddies, your neighbors. We are part of society. We laugh, we cry, we love and yearn to be loved. We are human beings. We love our families. We love our country. We are proud Filipinos who just happen to be LGBT. So the question is now, do we as members of the LGBT community share the same rights as all other citizens? Does the state grant us equal protection under our laws? An overview of legal references to the LGBT phenomenon shows that there are no direct references to lesbian, gay, transgender, and bisexual individuals. In fact, these terms are nowhere to be found in any of our existing laws, save for a few references to sexual orientation. It is clear, therefore, that this sector and its needs have been consistently overlooked. We lack psychosocial counselors equipped with the proper skills and training to respond to the needs of individuals with LGBT-related depression, anger, suicidal tendencies, and family relationship issues. There is no data concerning violations of labor standards involving LGBT employees. There is even confusion, even within the judiciary, with no less than the Supreme Court using LGBT and the term homosexual interchangeably in some of its decision, even if not all LGBT people are homosexuals. In our collective knowledge, the Philippines has had numerous incidents of hate crimes since against the LGBT. Sadly, only 164 of these have been document, documented as cases since 1996, because there is no single officer or even a desk within the DOJ, the PNP, and the NBI that documents and monitors such hate crimes. And when in June of 2011, the Human Rights Council introduced a joint statement urging states to end violence, criminal sanctions, and related human rights violations based on sexual orientation and gender identity, our own permanent representative to the UN did not support it. That is our situation. My dear brothers and sisters in the LGBT community, I want you to know that I am but one voice among many in this August chamber that says it is time. It is time to pass the anti-discrimination bill on the basis of sexual orientation and gender identity. And the time is now. Once passed, this measure will prohibit the following discriminatory acts. If an employer, whether from the private or public sector, include sexual orientation or gender identity in the criteria for hiring, promotion, transfer, designation, work assignment, reassignment, dismissal, performance review, selection for training in the computation of benefits, privileges, and allowances, that is 
discrimination. If a school or any educational or training institution refuses to admit a student or participant or chooses to expel him or her solely on the basis of sexual orientation or gender identity, that is discrimination. If a school imposes disciplinary sanctions, penalties, restrictions, and requirements harsher than the usual that infringe on the rights of students on the basis of sexual orientation and gender identity, that is discrimination. When a student or trainee is harassed, punished, or restricted due to the sexual orientation or gender identity of his parents or legal guardians, that is discrimination. My dear colleagues, if this measure is passed, the Commission on Elections will have no right to prohibit the registration or revoke the accreditation of an LGBT organization based on sexual orientation, just like what they did to Angladlad Party List. Never again should such an outright rejection and blatant act of discrimination by a government agency based on sexual orientation and gender identity be permitted under our laws. The bill also underscores the right of every LGBT individual to have access or use of establishments, facilities, utilities, or services, including housing. Bakit naman, bakit naman kaya may mga restaurants at clubs na ayaw magpapasok ng transgender individuals? How different are we from your other patrons? Di ba nagbabayad din naman kami? Ipinagbabawal ng batas na ito ang mga ganitong uri ng diskriminasyon. What if a member of the PNP harasses a person because he or she is LGBT? Then the proposed law will make the officer accountable for his or her actions. Harassment occurs when a person is arrested or placed in custody and subjected to extortion, physical or verbal abuse because that person is gay and vulnerable. One cannot also force a person to undertake any medical or psychological examination to alter the person's sexual orientation or gender identity without the consent of the person involved, as if we are dealing with a disease that has to be cured. If that person is a minor and below the age of discernment, then the approval of the appropriate family court shall be required, and the Office of the Solicitor General can represent that child. Now the question is, now that we have identified the situations of discrimination, what will happen to those who violate the law? A jail term of not less than one year, but not more than six years awaits. Add to that a fine of not less than 100,000 pesos to a maximum of 500,000 pesos. In addition, the court may sentence the guilty party to community service and to undergo human rights education, including familiarization with and exposure to the plight of the victims. What else does this measure seek to accomplish? Under Section 7, the women's and children's deaths now existing in all police stations shall also act on and attend to the complaints in cases covered by this act. Officers assigned to these desks shall undergo appropriate training with a human rights-based approach to include, among others, gender sensitivity, awareness and proper terminology, the dynamics of LGBT relationships, and the proper handling of hate crime investigations. Madam Speaker, my dear colleagues, nice ko lang sanang balikan at dugtungan na naging panawagan na aking yumaong ama sa inyo. Sana po, katulad ng inyong malugod na panggat, pagtanggap sa akin, ay tanggapin po ninyo ang pagiging pantay-pantay ng bawat Pilipino, LGBT man o hindi. I want to remind all of you here that recognizing our rights and dignity will no way diminish yours. We are not asking 
for extra rights or privileges. We simply ask for equality with inclusiveness and diversity. Our nation has so much to gain. And yet, sadly, previous attempts to pass this law have all failed. Madam Speaker, my dear colleagues, history awaits the time and the opportunity to pass the anti-discrimination bill on the basis of sexual orientation and gender identity is now. Ako po si Geraldine Roman, anak ng magiting na laulawigan ng bataan, transgender woman, mambabatas, Pilipino. Maraming maraming salamat po. Thank you, Representative Roman. Majority Floor Leader. Madam Speaker, I move that we recognize the lady from the Lone District of Dinagat Islands, uh, the Honorable Kaka Bagao, for her interpolation. Congresswoman Bagao is recognized. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Madam Speaker, I would like to ask if the representative from the 1st District of Bataan would yield to a few questions. Is Representative uh, Roman willing to uh, entertain some questions? I, I would be willing. Please proceed, Congresswoman Bagao. Thank you, Madam Speaker. First of all, before I interpolate the good Congresswoman from the 1st District of Bataan, Madam Speaker, I would like to tell her that long before she entered this chamber as a legislator,